In the series of highs and lows in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8 is the highest of the highs. This is the pinnacle of the celebration of this new life back in Israel after having been taken captive by Babylon. The city walls are rebuilt. Life is beginning again. And in this chapter, the law of God will be read to the community, and it'll be a time of celebration. It starts just by mentioning that it's the seven, seventh month and that all the people came together as one before the water gate. That is the on, on the east side of the city, an open area there. All the people come together and they tell Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. Now, this is actually a little confusing because this is the first time Ezra has been mentioned in the book. There's some evidence that originally the book of Ezra and Nehemiah were one document. And so if that's the case, then we would have had multiple chapters describing the events and activities of Ezra before we got to Nehemiah chapter 8. There's some other evidence that they were always two separate books, so we're not sure exactly about that. But regardless of these as a unified document or not, Ezra surely would have been a well-known person in the community. Even though he's not mentioned in the first seven chapters, he's kind of one of those guys in the community that doesn't need any introduction at this point. He was a key part of the initial wave back from captivity in Babylon, the re-establishment of the temple in Jerusalem before the city walls were built in Nehemiah. So he would have been a well-known guy. And in fact, even to this day, he is seen by uh, rabbinic Jews as sort of the ultimate rabbi, the ultimate interpreter of the Mosaic law. And so he's such a key figure in this era of the Old Testament. It's not a surprise that he's just mentioned as the one they would ask to read, to read the law to them. It is a little bit interesting that they ask for that, because we've, as we've seen earlier in the book, it seems that they have largely forgotten the law of God. And there will actually even be evidence in this chapter that they're unfamiliar with some pretty key elements of the content of the first five books of the Old Testament. Um, so maybe what we have here is that there are a small number of people who are still around from an earlier time that remember, hey, we need to get back to the law. And so this is a chance to now do that. It's possible that just in a certain sense, even in the, the certain sort of latent rhythms of the calendar year, they know it's, it's time to do the public reading of the law. In fact, it's actually instructed in the law to read the law publicly in the seventh month. But like I said, they don't seem to know that initially. But maybe somewhere in there, in the public, in the community consciousness is this awareness, it's time to read the law. Um, whatever the case, they, they will have this public reading, and it's an amazing scene. Back in Joshua 8, something similar happens at Mount Ebal, and there's a sort of rededication of ourselves to the things that Moses taught that God gave to Moses as the foundation of his instructions for his people. And this scene is amazing. They come to the water gate, and it says that everyone who could understand was there, men, women, older children, Everybody came together. A wooden platform was constructed just for this event. And Nehemiah and some people with him were standing up on the platform. And then there were also teachers spread through the crowd so that as, as Ezra would read the law, they would relay it and explain some things. There's probably three reasons why this type of a public reading of the law would happen and even why those distributed around the crowd would have been in place. First of all, probably your average person was illiterate. They would not have been able to read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy by themselves. They are farmers, construction workers, soldiers. They are people who their job would not have required them to read, and being able to read would have been largely for those who are in specific religious studies or very wealthy. So the common person probably couldn't read. They, If they could read, they probably didn't own their own copy of the Torah, of those first five books. So it's not like they would have a home library to go read this on their own. But there's also this challenge of language that seems to be mentioned here. In verse eight, it says that some of these speakers who are scattered through the crowd are translating. 
likely what we have there is that the law is being read in Hebrew, of course, which what it was written in, but that some of these speakers, some of these listeners do not speak Arama uh, Hebrew, they speak Aramaic. Aramaic was the had become the language of the common person in the Middle East at this point. In fact, that would carry on so much to the point that Jesus and his disciples probably mostly spoke Aramaic, even though the Hebrew scriptures would have been read in Hebrew in a synagogue. And so here there's enough people in the crowd that don't speak Hebrew, perhaps, that they would need for someone to actually translate it on the spot so that they could understand the law. But they stand up, up on this platform, Ezra and his companions, and the people stand up as well, and he offers praise to God, and the people call back, amen, amen, and he begins to read. And he begins to make his way through for hours, actually, just reading through the scriptures. And something amazing starts to happen. People begin to weep throughout the crowd. Perhaps what's happening is that they're realizing how off target they've been. As they hear about what God has done and the plan he's had and the promises he's made and the instructions that he's given, they realize we have gotten way off, so far off that that's why we were taken captive in Babylon, so far off that that's why we've had trouble in our community where some people are exploiting each other. This is cutting me to the heart. But what's fascinating is Nehemiah steps up and says, do not mourn. This is not a day to cry. This is the day, a day to celebrate. And he says, tonight, after the, today's reading, go home and eat the best food you can get your hands on. Drink sweet drinks. Send some to those who don't have any. Today is a day of celebration. And so they do. They go home they celebrate, they begin to sort of get their hearts and minds in a place of joy as the law is read. They come back the next day, and it's the second day of reading. It's hard to know how long it would have taken to read through these five books. A dramatized English reading might take around 15 or 16 hours. In Hebrew, with translation, perhaps it could take longer. Uh, but we don't exactly know how far they read on day one. But on day two, something distinct happens. It says they found out that in the seventh month, the month that they are in, you're supposed to celebrate a festival. It's sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles. Sometimes it's called the Feast of Booths. Um, in Hebrew, it's Sukkot. And this is the festival that reminds us how God provided for us when we left Egypt. We traveled through the wilderness. All along the way, he cared for us and provided for us. And so the people would literally take a week where they live in temporary dwellings, a, a nationwide camp out. And the tone of it is described as a festive, joyful occasion. So it's interesting. They seem to actually just be reading along and get to Leviticus 23 and say, I guess we're supposed to do this festival. It's day two of the seventh month of the year. It says we're supposed to start on the 15th day. So let's go get ready for it. And so it seems that they just sort of break camp and go prepare for this festival. And so they gather the materials it says they went and got branches to build their temporary dwellings, and they set up these booths so that they could experience the festival. And so every day for seven days, they would come and do a public reading of the scriptures, just like Leviticus 23 says they're supposed to do. And they would, they would celebrate uh, what God had done to bring them out of slavery in Egypt and now out of captivity in Babylon as well. How much more they have to be excited about. And that perhaps that's why it says there wasn't ever joy like this in the land of Israel from the time of Joshua up until now. Because now we actually have two captivities, two times of slavery that we've been freed from to celebrate today. And I'm struck by a few things about this passage as it models for us perhaps what it looks like to respond to the word of God. When you hear the instructions of God, what do you do? Part of what I, I, I see here is a certain instant obedience. 
Day two of the reading, they drop everything to go obey what they just learned. They found out we're supposed to celebrate a festival soon. We need to go get ready. Let's do it right now. Instant obedience. Most parents could agree that delayed obedience is generally the same as disobedience. I've heard some parents even say that to their kids as, as a sort of house rule, that if you don't obey right away, it's as if you haven't obeyed. There's something to be said for hearing and obeying, a certain simple, immediate response to the Word of God. I remember hearing someone challenge the idea that what if you just started reading Scripture and every command you see, just drop the Bible and go obey it. And so I remember in high school, I said, I'll do that. I'll just start in, in the New Testament. I'll start in Matthew and every instruction I read, I'll go do it. Now, it is tricky when you get to Matthew 5, it, where it is where it says that we're supposed to gouge out our eye and cut off our hand. And so I, I set it down. I said, I need to learn some more before I keep doing this exercise. But I don't want to lose that sense of instant obedience, that readiness to do what God instructed us to do. We see that in the people. They were uninformed. They were unaware. But as soon as they learned, it's time for Sukkot. Let's go get ready. So there's instant obedience here. We also see joyful obedience. That instruction from Nehemiah and that instruction in Leviticus 23 about Sukkot, about the Feast of Tabernacles, is that you are to be joyful for it. That strikes me as, as noteworthy because one of the most difficult parts of our lives to be obedient in is our feelings. They sort of come to us naturally. They are authentic and genuine to us, yet there is still something about that we are told to be responsible for. You're, doesn't matter what mood you're in, when Sukkot hits, it's time to celebrate. Nehemiah says, stop crying, be cheerful. This is a day for celebration. We hear similar things in the New Testament. I think of Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, where Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. It's a command from one of God's apostles, rejoice, be joyful. And this is among the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, Romans 14, verse 17. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In that context, he's talking about what should I eat, what should I not eat, the rules that govern that. But he says, what's more important than the details of what you do or don't eat is that you understand the kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy should characterize those who are part of the kingdom of God. Now we're going to see in the next chapter, in, verse, in chapter 9, there is a time of confession and mourning. And in fact, in Leviticus 23, when we celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, we're supposed to have a great assembly on the, day, on the eighth day. And that is a time of re recalling that that maybe there's ways we need to get right with God. But this joyful obedience, this willingness to say, okay, because of what God's done, because of his faithfulness in my life, because of his provision, I will choose to be joyful right now. My circumstances, my mood, whatever factors might be at play may make that difficult, but I will still take responsibility for the joy in my heart. Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. And so that just strikes me as interesting that they actually are able to move themselves from a time of weeping to a time of celebrating. And you and I have the Holy Spirit of God within us. The Spirit of, of God produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things the Spirit of God produces. And so I have to ask myself, if I am not finding joy on a particular day, is that because the Spirit of God is no longer characterized by joy? Or is that because I'm doing something or in a mindset of some kind that is not allowing the Spirit of God to produce that fruit? The Bible says, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So there is some type of partnership. There is some type of relationship we have that can suppress what God wants to do in our lives or to allow it to blossom. And so joyful obedience should be part of what comes when we respond to the Word of God. Instant obedience, 
a readiness to do what he says when he says it right now, and a joyful obedience, doing things with a, a rejoicing attitude of, of, of humble, joyful submission to God. That's what they did. And it says, day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. They obeyed immediately, they obeyed joyfully, and chapter eight is a party. Again, this is the high note. We wish things stayed this way for the people of Israel, but there's no reason they can't stay that way in our lives. We have the Spirit of God. Every day can be a day for instant obedience and joyful obedience. And so I, I want to challenge you to that. This is, this is a time, I think, for us to, in the midst of this series, to challenge ourselves. Are we obe being obedient to God's word? Are we responding with that type of a happy heart that's eager to do whatever it is he said for you? I invite for you to think through your life right now. Are there areas where he's calling you to fresh obedience? Are there ways that you could be obedient with a more joyful spirit rather than a begrudging spirit? I'm just going to leave it to the spirit of God for him to help you think about that because I can't make I can't hardly make myself joyful. I know there's nothing I can do for you, but the Spirit of God, this fruit of the Spirit, the kingdom of God, it is characterized by joy. So be joyful today as you obey the Word of God.